Atheist Nomads, episode 144, news for April 28, 2016. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo-hahs. Please be advised. We are the Atheist Nomads, bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Hello, everybody on the interwebs. Yeah, uh, Lauren's not joining us. She is doing her uh, coloring book thing. Oh, uh, sweet. I thought it was going to be on Thursday. No, it's it's today. Yeah. So, Wesley, how have you been? Oh, boy. Um, yeah, about that good. Uh, just stuff and shit and shit and stuff. I don't know. Uh, nothing really big going on, I suppose. Uh, riding every chance I get just to you know, feel the wind in my hair that's not really there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, Lauren got a job. Oh, shit. Yeah, she'll be starting on maybe later this week. If not later this week, then it'll be beginning of next week. Um, and uh, yeah, perfect hours for her. Uh, it's it's, it's going to be good. I'm excited. Badass. It'll be quite nice. I haven't been on the Facebooks very much, so I haven't seen what it, anything about it. Yeah, she'll be uh, awesome. Good working with uh, medical billing again. So, oh, cool. What she is, she should is be able to jump right into it. A professional for doing. Yeah, so it'll be a, a real easy start. So anyway, let's go ahead and get into dusting off the degree. Ooh. And I know I said last time that we'd be talking about the Mexican version of Mary in this week's episode, but this is episode 144. So the only logical topic for this week is the 144,000. This is found three times in the book of Revelation. The first is in Revelation 7, 3 to 8. Uh, saying, do not hurt the earth or the sea or the trees until after we have sealed the servants of God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed. And, well, so on and so forth, 12,000 from each of the tribes. 12,000 times 12 is 144,000. Revelation 14.1. Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And then a little bit later in Revelation 14, okay, down just, you know, a couple of verses, uh, Revelation 14, 3 to 5, and they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who would be redeemed from the earth, for it is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed for mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. And so this is, you know, three times that it comes up in a couple verses. So uh, a lot of Christians have various different beliefs about the 144,000. A lot view it as okay. There, there are the people who think it is is figurative for all of God's people, uh, because twelve is viewed as prophetic speak for to- for totality, mm-hmm. and twelve is squared in this case, and then also multiplied by a thousand. So, really freaking serious about it's all of God's people. Seriously, seriously, it definitely, definitely is type of of, of mindset with that. Uh, but that's the people who, who spiritualize this and, and make it literal or make it figurative. Um, of course, some people just take it to the point of revelation is complete and utter bullshit, which obviously it is. Now, there are also people who believe that this is literal. Many believe that it is the literal number of Jewish Christians either what? at the time that, cause it does talk about the sons of Israel. 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. And so people who believe these are Jewish Christians, either 
Jewish Christians at the time that Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, or that these will be Jewish Christians when Jesus returns. And there'll be 144,000 of them. Then there's the Adventist version, which I am most familiar with. Uh, The ones, originally they did think that it was the only ones who were saved. But by the time there was more than 144,000 Adventists, that view just didn't quite work anymore. So now they're just special people. Uh, Often believed the Adventists view the prophetic use of women, excuse me, as uh, churches, uh, like the The Bride of Christ being God's church. Sure. Uh, The harlot in Revelation uh, being with the the cup of her fornications. Uh, She's the Catholic Church. Um, You know, (laughs) stuff like that. Uh, So. For Adventists, a lot believe that the the part about them being virgins just means that they haven't defiled themselves with apostate churches. And so these people, not defiled, um, they will be the special ones who will uh, try to help redeem as many people on earth before Christ's return, and then uh, they will have a, a special place in, in heaven. Uh, Then there's the Jehovah's Witnesses, probably the best known for their view on the 144,000. They originally also believed that they were the only ones who were saved. Just 144,000. Well, once there were more than 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses, they had to tweak that a little bit. So now, those are the only ones who will be priest kings in heaven. The rest of the people who are saved will wait in the ground dead until the end of the thousand years, and then uh, they will be resurrected to the earthly paradise. But for Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, they they actually now have uh, about 144,000 people who believe they are God's anointed 144,000. So that, that's, that's getting to where there's... Uh, there might be some competition there, but they definitely think that at least all the church elders and leaders are are going to be among that number. Then there are scopeczists. <laughs> These are a, a Russian. It's a Russian church, very small Russian church. They believe that the Messiah, Messiah will return when there are one hundred and forty four thousand scoptist believers, scoptsy believers. So basically, never. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> The Unif- Unification Church of Reverend Moon uh, believes that the number is how many people Christ must find who, and I quote, can restore through indemnity the missions of all the past saints who, despite their best efforts to do God's will, fell prey to Satan when they were failed by their respons- or in their responsibilities. He must find these people during his lifetime, and lay the foundation of victory over Satan's world. This was in his book, The Exposition of the Divine Principles. Or, excuse me, Divine Principle. And so, you know, 144,000, it's a number very, very popular with Christians. You also find it occasionally in Islam, uh, some New Age groups like the Raelians and in the Mayan calendar. Uh, But for Christians, that's a really special number for all kinds of reasons, if we as we have seen. So, on that note, we'll take a break, and then we'll be back with history. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low-price, full-featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A-R-C-H-W-A-Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads. That's P A T R E O N.com forward slash atheist nomads. This day in history, April 28th, starting with the lovely year 1932, a vaccine for the yellow fever is announced for use on humans. Hooray! So, hooray! Science! Yay! Uh, yeah, uh, it, I'm going to backtrack already here, but uh, I found this really interesting. In 1927, the yellow fever virus became the first human virus to be to actually be isolated. Oh. Uh, 
Yeah, but uh, yeah, just wanted to put that up front here. Uh, but anyways, the attenuated live vaccine stem 17D was developed in 1937 uh, by Max Thyler. He seemed to, to be the one to actually get a really good uh, vaccine going. But uh, yeah, even, even now, yellow fever causes over 200,000 infections uh, and 30,000 deaths every year, with hmm. nearly 90% of these occurring in Africa. So holy shit. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is, of course, uh, a very, actually very dangerous uh virus mm-hmm. it's uh <laughs> yeah kind of crazy it's, it's spread by mosquitoes like a lot of them well female mosquitoes and it's what can i say just horrible shit i mean oh man when uh, you it, it, you look at the stories of some of the the early construction efforts in uh panama and you know u.s troops in in puerto rico and and cuba a hundred years ago canal. Yellow fever was one of the many diseases that really wreaked havoc. Oh, sure. I mean, you're getting fever, chills, loss of appetite, uh, nausea, muscle pains, back headaches. I'm sure you're getting the shits, too. I mean, it's just hell. And then you get better for a little bit. And if you're not so lucky, it gets really bad and you kind of turn yellowish. And that's when... uh, 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 the risk of bleeding and kidney problems uh, starts really kicking in. So yeah, then you're proper fucked. Damn. So if you know if you're one of the unlucky ones, you're you're screwed pretty quick. So yeah, uh, if you ever go into a if you ever have a chance to get all your booster shots when you do any traveling, do it. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Okay. Well, moving on along. Here's a, an interesting note, an interesting day. This day in history, the year 1984, Dustin, our lovely voice, is born. <laughs> in, a, in a crack, all right. Yep, yep, uh, this is going up on my birthday. Yay. I'll be uh, 32, and uh, yeah, 1984, I was uh, born in... Ontario, Oregon, at what was then the Holy Rosary Hospital, delivered by the same doctor who delivered my three siblings and my mom and most of my aunts and uncles. Wow. That's the same doctor who diagnosed my mom with cancer four years before uh, because of the fact that she went through a year and a half of radiation and chemo uh, with uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, They, at that time, did not think she'd be able to get pregnant afterwards. Those were very, very high doses of of uh radiation very high doses of chemo and uh lo and behold i was born uh they they held us in the hospital uh an extra night um just to make sure everything was okay um then when my mom had her next checkup at the mountain state tumor institute uh, in boise uh she went in and had me with her the doctors took me aside for a couple hours and examined me shocked that i was well, there and healthy and normal. Uh, I When I first moved uh, to Boise, I went on a couple dates with a girl who her mom had also gone through lymphoma treatment at Misty before having her. The prognosis she got, at least as far as having children afterwards, was it'd be possible. Thanks to your mom? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so wow. this girl's mom was getting treatment in 1985. So by that point, the uh, it was a few months after the doctors had examined me and found out that, yes, you can go through all of that insane treatment that would t- today be malpractice and <laughs> still be okay. I, a couple of years ago, I looked into, because I, I grew up believing I was a miracle. Mm. Well, based on the lack of information available in the 80s, yes, my birth was miraculous. With the amount of information available now, uh only slightly less probable than anybody else. Wow. (laughs) The the uh, prognosis on having children post-cancer treatment depends on the type of cancer and the type of treatment, but on average, uh, it is a 50% reduction in fertility and only a doubling of birth defect rates. (laughs) So 
1984, they assumed the worst, and now they know, yeah, it's nowhere near as bad. Huh. Well, we did. All right, moving on. Yes, yes, go ahead and move oh. on. All right. This day in history, the day, <laughs> this day in history, the year is 1986. And this is uh, the day that high levels of radiation resulting from tr- the Chernobyl disaster are detected at a nuclear power plant in Sweden, leading <laughs> leading to the Soviet authorities to publicly announce the incident. Oh, wow. Yeah, slash accident. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> what can I say? Chernobyl actually went, to, well, meltdown and fire on the 26th, but yeah. Sweden detected it a couple of days later. Yeah. Anyways, um, let's get on with this. Uh, the Chernobyl disaster was definitely the worst nuclear po- uh, power plant ex- accident in history in terms of cost and casualties. And it's uh, the only other level seven event, which is the maximum uh, classification for this. Uh, the other, of course, being Fukushima, which uh, the Fukushima Daihachi Mm-hmm. Uh, which happened in 2011. But uh, holy shit. Yeah, kind of crazy. The battle to contain the contamination and avert a uh, greater catastrophe ultimately involved over 500,000 workers and a cost of an estimated 18 billion rubles, which must be like, you know, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars uh, During the accident itself, 31 people died. And, you know, of course, the long-term effects of cancers and other things are still being investigated and kind of fucking crazy kind of fucking scary i mean that was the the, the scary shit when i was a little kid you know well that that 18 billion rubles uh a lot more than just a few hundred thousand dollars it is sure, sure. Uh, one of those one of the events that is uh easily linked to the downfall of the soviet union Kind of starting the, the the change in things. The the public was upset with how how it was handled. Oh, uh, definitely. There was it was a clusterfuck all the way around. Oh yeah, there wasn't any any transparency with it. The response was uh, too small. Okay, we are back now. Um, for our listeners, uh, this break didn't happen, uh, but we had a uh, I had a crash and we had some connection issues. Um, I don't know why several of my applications crashed, but they did all at the same time. So mm. weird. Anyway, um, we are back. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> oh, boy. <clears throat> all right. So, yeah, we were, on, uh, I think, just wrapping up on Chernobyl. Uh, as long as it made through the last, you know, still being investigated, then, yeah, we're good. Moving on along. The year 1994. Uh, former Central Intelligence Agency counterintelligence officer and analyst Aldrich Ames pleads guilty to giving the U.S. secrets to the United to the uh, Soviet Union and later to Russia. <sighs> okay, for shame. Not even, not even going to repeat that one. Uh, okay, so yeah, um, this dude uh, really fucked us over. He's kind of like the boogeyman to all of us government officials, all of us uh, government workers. He actually earned over $4.6 million from the Soviets. Wow. Uh, yeah, and this is like at twenty dollars to $50,000 a pop most of the times. So, yeah, he was betraying and getting people killed for a long period of time. Motherfucker. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it he um what can i say he's he's a he was an asshole yeah uh don't get me wrong uh the things that the cia do are generally i would probably disagree with most of them but you know what trying people and getting them killed is wrong too Mm -hmm. motherfuck yeah anyways uh fuck him that's over and uh this is the one that i've really wanted to talk about anyways so, this day in history, the year, 1996, the Port Arthur Massacre in Ta- in Tasmania. Um, a gunman, Martin Bryant, opens fire at the Broad Arrow Cafe in Port, Port Arthur, Tasmania. So, uh, 
I'm sure that most of you have heard about this event at least a little bit. Hope you have. But if um, not, go back and listen to our episode with Nick Morgan Moore. Oh yeah, fucking a. This is something that I didn't know. Uh, the ma- the massacre actually let, went over a two day span from April 28th to the 29th, and it was definitely you know a killing spree by Martin, like I was saying, in which 35 people were killed and another 23 wounded. It occurred mainly at the historic Port Arthur, uh, which is a former prison colony. Fucking leave it to Australia to you know turn a former prison into like a a popular tourist site. <laughs> <laughs> Still, I mean, like, what the fuck? Anyways, uh, the part that I I don't get me wrong, it's completely fucked up, and I wish this wouldn't have happened. But I really envy Australia right now. That uh, the Port Arthur massacre, you know, it definitely remains one of the deadliest shootings worldwide committed by a single person. But uh, following the spree, the Prime Minister of Australia uh, at the time, John Howard, introduced uh, strict gun control laws within Australia and formulated the National Firearms Program Implementation Act of 1996, which restricted the private ownership of high capacity semi automatic rifles, semi automatic shotguns and pump action shotguns, as well as introducing uniform firearm licensing. It was implemented with uh, bipartisan support by the Commonwealth states and territories. So fuck, why can't we do that here? And you're like, we have the NRA. I, <laughs> I'm sure they had a version of, of the NRA down there too, but we didn't either until quite recently, at least a version of the NRA, like what we have now. Uh, what we have now is just, you know, the NRA used to be known for uh, teaching gun safety courses and hunter sure. education and making sure that hunting was legal and, you know, stuff like that. Hmm. For some reason, in the last 20, 30 years, they have switched over to more and more guns. Well, you know, I've I've seen a, a meme floating around my Facebook in the last I don't know, a week or so talking about, uh, you know, all those crazy Republicans or crazy religious people saying, you know, keep all these trans people out of the, out of the bathrooms. But you know what, when it comes to shooting people, eh, don't really care. Don't really care if there's a mass shooting, just, you know, keep on going about your business. Mm-hmm. So, you know what? Fuck all you guys. Uh, <laughs> me, a gun owner, gun owner, I would turn in my guns especially if they, you know, gave me market value or, you know, I wouldn't want to just give them away for free. That's thousands of dollars I spent on that shit. But yeah, man, I would, I would love to see some, some real honest to goodness, you know, guns, gun laws that get enacted in this country. Mm-hmm. I'm a gun owner as well. I am down to one and just haven't gotten around to selling that one yet, but yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Fuck. <gasps> All right. Well, we're going to take another quick break and we'll be back with science and technology. We love hearing from our listeners. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com, tweet us at atheistnomads, send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads, or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. The Brainstorm Podcast presents The Shift to Reason, Saskatchewan's first secular conference. It's happening on April 30th, 2016, and features some great speakers that include Seth Andrews, Nate Phelps, and Levada Leaning, along with others. This one-day event in Regina includes lunch and a VIP after-party with the speakers. Tickets are available at shifttoreason.eventbrite.ca and start at $95 for early bird tickets with student pricing and limited VIP tickets. Keep up to date with the conference on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash shifttoreason. This first one's really cool. So All right. Most uh, rechargeable batteries today are lithium ion. Uh, you yep. know, for example, my, my e-cig right now, I've got two lithium ion batteries in here. These batteries are filled with with a liquid. Uh, that's mm. the the electrolyte in there, and they will generally corrode to the point where they cannot hold a usable charge after a few thousand recharges. 
uh, when you're doing, you know, relatively high amp uses like I do, uh, you can start noticing that a little bit faster than you would in, in normal, more normal uses. Uh, laptops, you'll often see a, a noticeable dip within a year or two, and then within three years, they don't hold char- a charge. Cell phones, same same thing. Uh, All right. You know what else has electrolytes? Brondo. Just trust me on that. Okay, Please. I don't know what Brondo is, but moving along, uh, the lithium-ion batteries, uh, you know, they've been around for quite a while, and as a result, there isn't a whole lot of room left for improvement. Really about all they can do now is get a little bit more capacity. Mm. Now, in the last five years or so, they've gone, like in the 18650s, from 2,000 milliamp hours to now they're, they're at about 3,000. Uh, with high amp batteries. So, you know, there is progress that is being made and will continue to be made, but nothing cutting down on them going, unfortunately, to landfills when really they should all be recycled, um, assuming you actually have a place to recycle them where you live. So what we need now is a vastly different type of battery. And this brings us to the manganese oxide-coated gold nanowires that researchers at UC Irving have been working with. And rather than using a liquid, they have actually managed to pull off an electrolyte gel. This has been kind of like the holy grail for battery development. But nobody's been able to do it because gels just aren't as conductive as liquids. And what they've actually found is this gel accidentally protects against corrosion. Wasn't intended, but it does. And so what they've found is that there is actually so little corrosion that there's only a 5% reduction in capacity after, wait for this, 200,000 charge cycles. Nice. Now, of course, they weren't working with real batteries. These were proof-of-concept models where they were just pushing current directly through. But once these, they actually get these gold uh, nanowires paired up with both a cathode and an anode, the potential for this is a battery that can be recharged over and over for at least a hundred years. Damn. Now we just need to find a substitute for that gold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, yeah, the cost of the gold would make these prohibitively expensive, but there's just so much gold in the world. They, they're looking at nickel as an, an alternative. Uh, so they're going to play around with, with that next. Uh, but if they could pull this off with, a cheaper, more plentiful metal. Uh, the place, you know, I don't see this as being all that beneficial for things like cell phones and laptops. No, the tech changes too quick. But for electric cars, you know, if you're having to swap out the lithium ion battery packs in your car every three to five years, that is insanely expensive. Thousands of dollars. But if they could put in batteries that will last you your entire lifetime. <laughs> Not too shabby. Now they just have to work on quick charging. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, be awesome if you have a, a battery that, you know, lasts for a hundred years, but you know, if it takes, you know, five hours to, to get a usable charge out of it. Then... Well, if you've got the capacity in the battery to drive a hundred miles off a half hour charge, not bad. Mm. Yeah, still not great. Three hundred miles is the 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 perfect range that they've been they've been pointing or looking towards. Uh, yeah, but they need to get that down to about a ten minute charge. Really? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I would say they'd probably be okay if you could get a two hundred mile range off a ten minute charge and three hundred mile range off a longer charge. Then then you're 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 pretty good because most people don't drive more than five hundred miles in a day. I yeah. yeah. I do frequently, but I'm, I'm weird. And you're in the country. Mm-hmm. Ish. Sorry, oh, but heck. I, n- even in the city, it's still the country in, I- in Idaho. When, when I lived in, in the Seattle area, I still would, it wasn't uncommon for me to drive long distances like that. <laughs> anyway, the, uh, uh, coral reefs are found in clear tropical waters along the edges of continental shelves, mm. or at least so everyone has thought. Patricia Yeager of the University of Georgia and Rodrigo Rodrigo Mora 
of the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro were doing an exploratory search of what's found at the murky sediment-rich waters at the mouth of the Amazon. Mora had found or had heard stories of people finding reef fish at the mouth of the Amazon. Uh, Jaeger is not a reef expert, but knew that wasn't possible. It's too dark and dirty there. And so what they found was a vibrant reef ecosystem. Nice. They were dredging the waters when they pulled up corals and all kinds of reef life. Oh, shit. (laughs) This is an area that has had... It's undergoing major, major oil exploration right now. Uh, It's getting overfished, and there is the fear that this might have been, you know, it might be too late. At the very least, all of the environmental impact studies that have been done on all these, especially oil projects, are meaningless now. Every single one of those is wrong. You don't... Hmm. The the environmental impact for a relatively lifeless river mouth is very different than the environmental impact on a active major coral reef system. Fucking A. But now that this has been published, the the potential for more discoveries to be made based off of this and then just looking in places nobody thought to look before around the rest of the world. Uh, this is one of those things that a, a coral reef system... How has this made it to 2016 without being found yet? That is mind boggling. Well, you know, the Columbia is definitely too cold, but I wonder about the Nile. Mm hmm. You know, it's a pretty fucking big river. Mississippi, maybe? Possibly. It's pretty, it's pretty warm down there. Uh, I think the Mississippi would be a lot less likely because it, that's cold water dumping in. Okay, okay. Compared to the Amazon. Sure. Or the Nile. Mm-hmm. Hmm. All right. Let's go ahead and take another break, and then we'll be back with politics and religion. Mm-hmm. As a listener of the show, I'm going to assume you love my sexy vocal stylings. If you love the rest of the show as much as my voice, consider giving us the resources we desperately need to purchase quality cocaine and Red Bull. We make it super easy to make a one-time donation or to support us on a per-episode monthly or even annual basis using PayPal or Patreon. Find out more at atheistnomads.com. Use the links on the right side of the page. A dollar an episode is all we ask. So, Target is now the target of an American Family Association boycott and a petition with over a half a million signatures all over their announcement of a policy that allows transgender people to use the restroom and changing room that matches their gender identity. Mm. They're getting a lot of hate for being decent human beings and for having policies that, to me, seem pretty common sense. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, boy. I I have a feeling that this half million people are probably people that are only shopping at walmart anyways yeah so probably them. probably sam's club yeah yeah i i really don't think this is gonna hurt uh target's bottom line that much and in fact it might actually have the reverse because you know what when people find out that you know target is being inclusive mm-hmm. i have i have a feeling that there's they're actually gonna pull in more customers yeah so, fuck all you Christian fucks. Oh, yeah. The, uh, <laughs> uh, what is it? Uh, the Streisand effect? Basically. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I haven't shopped at Target in... It's been a few years. I still do on occasion. I haven't even... I don't have one convenient for me, so it hasn't yeah. been something I've even really thought about. But now, yeah, maybe. Mm. Yeah. I got one about 15 minutes away. I don't mind going there. Even if they are owned, last I knew, by the French, you know, fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the French aren't that bad. Eh. Moving along to a, a somewhat related uh, story, at least moving along the LGBT uh, acronym. Uh, in 2012, Charlie Craig and David Mullins got married in Massachusetts. Yay. But they wanted a cake for the reception they were going to have back home in Colorado. Huh. 
Makes sense. Uh, they were refused service by Baker Jack Phillips. The couple then complained to the Colorado Civil Rights Commission, which ruled against Phillips in 2013, claim, uh, ruling that he had discriminated against the couple and that he needed to change his policy or face fines. <laughs> the Colorado Court of Appeals also ruled against the Baker, and now the Colorado Supreme Court has refused to hear the case, letting the lower court ruling stand. Hooray! <laughs> Jack Phillips, the baker, says he has no problem serving gay people, but that his sincerely held religious beliefs prevent him from making cakes for same-sex weddings, and that this also violates his free speech rights because the cakes are, quote-unquote, artistic expression. Fuck off, Jack. Make a cake. Artistic expression. Yeah. He, he should have just stuck with the religious beliefs part. Uh, you know, obviously, the, the Colorado Supreme Court didn't think this had any merits. Nobody else who's heard the case thinks it has any merits. Uh, his lawyers are thinking about an appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. <laughs> but uh, right now, with the split court, they're not likely to actually do anything. Well, I think Jack Phillips was just trying to throw as much shit at the wall and see what, what would stick, and, well, nothing stuck. Mm -hmm. So, again, fuck you, Jack. Make a cake. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. If I were those two guys, I would still go back there after this and say, hey, make a cake. <laughs> <laughs> and then not even walk it out of the building, just like quote unquote trip and fall and just let it spill everywhere and then walk the fuck out after you pay for it <laughs> oh. fuck it don't want it moving along Bishop Zbigniu Kernikowski you nailed it of Everyone. Lignica Poland uh, has approved a miraculous Eucharist host for veneration just in time for the 1050th anniversary of Christianity arriving to Poland in the form of their then Duke being baptized. Wow. The consecrated host fell on the floor on Christmas 2013. For some reason, <laughs> this cracker was placed in a container with water. Soon after that, it developed red stains. A few months later, February 2014, it underwent examination. And the medical report said that, and I quote, in the histopathological image, the fragments were found containing the fragmented parts of the cross uh, striated muscle. It is most similar to the heart muscle. The report also said that it was definitely from human tissue. So obviously this is a miracle. It's proof that the cracker does really turn into Christ's flesh. I am now done with this podcast. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Uh, what the fuck is wrong with these people? They must have gotten either a falsified report or slides mixed up or, well, yeah, one of those. And miraculous? That's not blood coming out of flesh. That is mold growing on a cracker. You drop a cracker on the floor, you're going to pick up more molds and bacterias. You put it into a moist environment like water that mold and bacteria will grow. What the fuck? <laughs> you know, it, I don't know. It, it It's just possible that, you know, I don't know, skin cells are just like floating in that water from everybody doing whatever they do in the water. I don't know. Just, uh, no, that don't doesn't know, explain just, the, the histological report or histopathological re report. Uh, hmm. That is clearly either a fabrication or it is a mixed up specimen or a falsified specimen shit happens like i wouldn't be surprised if somebody's like oh we need a miracle so uh this slide with cracker let's switch that one with this one over here okay here you go doctor take a look at this specimen hmm. and moving along since Turkey's modern founding after the fall of the Ottoman Empire, it has been a secular state, and the nation has a constitution that doesn't mention Allah at all. Hmm. The current regime 
has uh, certainly been trying to weaken this. And now the parliamentary speaker says that Turkey is a Muslim country and as such should have a new Islamic constitution. Hmm. Man. <laughs> I mean, I mean that, that was like the one thing in Turkey really had going for it. That and from what I've heard, pretty good food. Yeah. Turkey's been a, a candidate for EU membership. Hmm. That's not going to happen if they declare themselves themselves an Islamic state. Granted, if they were rejected on those grounds, I am sure they would be uh, getting quite a few complaints because they have quite a few members that are explicitly Christian states. Hmm. England as a good example. And uh, Father Joseph Jayapal was charged with raping two adolescent girls in his Minnesota parish in 2004 and 2005, including forcing at least one of the girls to give him a blowjob. He then fled back to his native India, but was eventually extradited back to Minnesota. As part of a plea bargain, he admitted to molesting one of the girls. He then spent a year and a day in prison, thus counting as a a felony, and was deported back to India. The Catholic Church also suspended him from the priesthood. So far, uh, a year and a day is pretty short for raping adolescents, but better than what happens with most priests. Uh, Well, until February, when the Vatican approved lifting the suspension and he's been assigned uh, to a parish in India as the Diocesan Head of Education. Right. Because all those kids need to get trained up. Yep. Yeah. Convicted, admitted child fucker put back in charge of teaching kids. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. In India, a place where he will realistically, based on, on what I understand of the culture, he will have an easier time getting away with it. The only kids he should be in charge of are like baby goats. Mm-mm. No, no, he does not need to be fucking goats well i have have a feeling he probably wouldn't do that he likes kids you know two-legged kids uh all right bringing it back uh stateside for a moment a uh, 79 year old in athel idaho this is near uh, coeur d'alene so it's up in idaho's crazy panhandle yeah that weird neck thing Uh, yes there there is a huge difference between southern idaho where i am and the panhandle panhandle is where the white power supremacists are. where they used to be they got be? kicked out anyway oh. uh people in southern idaho like to mock northern idaho and uh coeur d'alene really should be a part of of eastern washington not no northern idaho no we don't want them either <laughs> <laughs> it's what's funny when you look at it on the map it's really and especially when you look at the history on how it was all drawn up You had Oregon carved out of the Oregon Territory. You had parts of Montana carved out and given over to help form the uh, Dakota Territory. Then you had Washington carved out. Idaho was just what was left over. (laughs) Yeah, Idaho is a thing none of us wanted. It's just this, it's mostly, it's mountains and desert. Mm. It's all either mountain or desert. That's not the most habitable place. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, this 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 seventy nine year old man in Athol, uh, Peter Christian Jensen the fourth, obviously uh, perfect name for a serial killer. Uh, not that I'm <laughs> saying he's a serial killer. Uh, he filed a suit. You against, heard it here first. <laughs> he filed a suit against Edward R. Primble, who is a uh, somebody who works for the Idaho Department of Transportation, and this has been. It is the final step, or at least the, the next step in his lengthy and so far unsuccessful process of trying to get the court to waive a $221 filing fee, reinstate his driver's license, and not make him get insurance. Because he believes that the state of Idaho is an artificial person, and that under Mosaic law, uh, the state's laws are just fiction. Mm. And he has very strong religious belief that there's only one God and his name is Jehovah and that (laughs) 
he has handed down laws to Moses and to the people of Israel, and people who believe in Jehovah are commanded to obey only his statutes. So he's not subject to the jurisdiction of the state of Idaho. Um, according to his views, he does not need to give money to the insurance god, <laughs> and he should be able to drive without auto insurance. So what you're saying is this guy is uh, trying to get Citizens United repealed and other stuff. <laughs> no, no. Um, definitely not going for that. He, uh, <laughs> he He's actually seeking for $6,689,940 in damages. That is awfully close to $666,000. Yeah, yeah. He will only accept it payable in gold or silver. Obviously. Because currency is debt and bad. Mm. And if he doesn't get paid within 30 days, then he wants Primble, Primble's children, and all of Primble's descendants forever to be given over to him as servants until they have earned off or paid off the six point six nine million dollars right let's bo- fuck it let's bring slavery back okay sure because the law of moses yeah totally. so what, what's hilarious here this guy a uh sovereign citizen nutter yeah yeah nutter um he does not believe the state of idaho is a proper authority or has any real power yet he is filing a complaint in a court of the state of idaho Yep. So he's asking the state of Idaho to endorse his views that the state of Idaho is a fiction. They they probably won't agree with him. No and, no. and I'm also betting he has a track record of paying these things in the past. Yeah. Now, one thing I do want to point out here, uh, he's 79. Yeah. I, I hope the court uh, gets him to a doctor to get checked out for dementia or at least you know helps him not pass his eye test yeah yeah uh a 70 regardless of of age somebody who has views like that obviously would not could not be expected to actually follow the rules of the road (laughs) thus should not be driving on our roads And if this is any indication that he has dementia, I definitely don't want him on the roads. Well, I mean, if he doesn't believe in Idaho, why should he believe in Idaho's, you know, speed limits? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, for our final uh, tragic story, Mm. uh, in the last two months, six bodies have been found with their ears, hearts and genitals missing in and around Zambia's capital, Lusaka. The police have labeled the killings as ritualistic, and rumors started last week that these killings were committed by Rwandans for use as charms and for witchcraft. Oh, no. In response, angry mobs last week looted and destroyed about 60 Rwandan-owned businesses and burned alive two of their fellow Zambians, likely mistaken for Rwandans. More than 250 people have been arrested for the riots and 11 for the killings, and the police are actively looking for anyone and everyone who's been spreading this rumor and setting off these riots to arrest. What the fuck? (laughs) Holy shit. Seriously, guys? Okay, six people dead, missing their ears, hearts, and genitals. That's freaky. It sounds like a mob hit, but freaky. But holy shit, you pick a minority group and say, oh, it must have been them. So you just start targeting them. They destroyed 60 businesses and killed two people. Oh, and in all these searches, they haven't found any body parts in any Rwandan homes or businesses. Because obviously people have been searching to see if these accusations are accurate. Have they looked around their necks? I'm sure they're wearing these things on strings around their necks. Look for the guy with lots of flies around his neck. (laughs) Come on. Uh, God God. damn. 
what the fuck? I mean, if you're going to steal something, take his fucking kidneys and sell them. Mm. Yeah. Not that I'm advocating anything like that, but yeah, come on. All right. Let's go ahead and move to feedback. All right. Uh, regarding episode 134, so 10 weeks ago, uh, I have been <laughs> listening. This is a, a week old comment on uh, YouTube. I've been listening to you guys through iTunes and I keep imagining what you two looked like. Nothing Uh-oh. like what I imagined. Good. I'm fucking sexy. Dead sexy. <laughs> Julie, not sure what you imagined, but realistically, nobody ever looks like you imagine. Because in your imagination... Well, anyway, yeah, nobody ever does. Like, I, I know I had a, a picture of what Eli and Lamar looked like from uh, they, Chariots of Iron. They actually kind of looked like I thought they would. And then I met them, and it was like, <laughs> okay, Eli looks just like I kind of pictured he would. <laughs> Lamar, not so much. Mm. <laughs> I expected Lamar to be taller. Oh, yeah. Anyway, uh, episode regarding episode one forty two and the live show. Uh, Jonathan Tendell sent me a message. Listening to the live show, I am cracking up. Fucking a friend of the show and past guest. Yep, uh, Jaded Zappa at Atheist Nomads. Hey, not racist. Sm- uh, frowny face. Hashtag pouts. Yeah, uh, that, that that was me being drunk and having some fun with with Lauren, but yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and I was drunk too, so I kind of... In fact, when I saw it on Twitter, I didn't even remember... I, I nah. couldn't place what he was talking about because... Well, I'm so fucking glad you put a timestamp because I was like, what the fuck? I went yeah. up to YouTube myself. Yeah, yeah I was yeah. drunk while recording and sick while editing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, from Randy Lamonda, video is funny as hell. Yay to sci-fi podcast, smile emoticon. Fucking eh. And when you copy the Facebook comment, it actually copies the smile emoticon as the words smile emoticon. Yeah. Right. That's cute. And from Randy again, regarding episode 143, pimp the coloring books more. How much? Uh, if it's uh-huh. Lauren's coloring books, yeah. Uh, if you want them, uh, go on to atheistnomads.com, go to the PayPal button and, uh, send us, uh, 10 bucks saying that you, and put a note in that you're wanting a coloring book and we'll send you coloring books. Oh, does that include shipping? Uh, okay. Let's do this for $5. You can have a digital copy and print it at home. $10. Mm. We'll ship it to you. All right. Heard it here first, folks. Yeah. Get them while they're hot. And uh, I am trying to convince Lauren to set up a Patreon account for mm-hmm. making coloring books because she's planning on making more. She's really oh. getting getting into the drawing. And the uh, as popular as that is getting, I could definitely imagine that doing well. Yeah. But she is starting a, a new job and will have less time. And I, I still want snuggle time. So sure, we'll, sure. we'll see. Understandable. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so no promises there. And uh, we did get a new iTunes review. Holy shit. I will not be reading it on the show. Is it that bad? There were some mean parts. <laughs> okay. There were some very nice parts. There were some very mean parts. Five star? Three star. Oh. What the fuck? If, you, if you're going to like give us less than five, you know, just don't do it. <laughs> uh, that's yeah. all right. So, yeah, uh, we, we did get one. We aren't reading it, but uh, we do love iTunes reviews, so please give us more, especially if they're five-star and you say we're we're wonderful and our, we fart rainbows and... Fucking A. I yeah. do. Hey, we should be showing up on Google Play here really quick, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, Google Play for Podcasts is, uh, is coming out. It's starting to go live. Yeah. Yeah. I just uh, got yeah. the ability to search for podcasts in my Google oh, Play. Oh, Nice. We are submitted. I do know Sweet. that. All right. And uh, you can always email us at contact at atheistnomads.com. You can call us at 541-203-0666. You can also hit us up on Twitter at Atheist Nomads, on Facebook at facebook.com slash Atheist Nomads. And you can also support us by going to paypal dot, or to atheistnomads.com and click the links on the right-hand side or you can go to patreon.com slash atheist nomads. Uh, we don't have any new supporters again, uh, but we, we, we love you anyway, especially we our, tried, our current we, supporters. 
we treasure you guys that you know you know kick us a few bucks so thank you so much yeah and we'll be back next week with an interview with somebody who actually knows what he's talking about this is the, this is the true <laughs> yeah an actual oh, professional with a i believe a degree in md everything. Ooh. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find show notes and contact information at atheistnomads.com. Follow us on Twitter at Atheist Nomads and like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Atheist Nomads. Please subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcatcher of choice. And while you're there, feel free to leave us a review. Theme music is courtesy of Sturdy Fred. Until next time, this has been the Atheist Nomads.